So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, buonasera a tutti che sono collegati in Italia. Uh, good evening to people who are in Italy. Uh, I am Stan Pugliese from the History Department at Hofstra University, and I want to welcome you to the second uh, session of our Italian American Experience Lecture Series, now into our 25th or 26th year. Uh, before I begin and introduce uh, this afternoon's speaker, uh, I want to take an opportunity to thank my colleagues at the Hofstra Cultural Center, uh, the director, Athleen Collins, um, uh, Carol Mallison, Janine Rinaldi, and the entire staff there. For more than 25 years, the Hofstra Cultural Center has uh, done all of the logistical work for our lecture series. And uh, during the academic year, they host more than 200 events on campus or now over the past pandemic year on Zoom. So uh, much of the cultural life of the university goes through the Cultural Center and we have to thank them for their uh, wonderful work, okay? Uh, this afternoon, we have a special treat because uh, I guess one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that we have all become masters of the Zoom universe. And so, uh, you know, usually we are constrained by uh, geography uh, and travel that we can only bring people from the New York metropolitan area to our lecture series on campus. But uh, this afternoon, we are very fortunate to have a dear friend uh, all the way from the Amalfi Coast uh, with us this afternoon. Um, before I do the formal introduction, I also want to thank, in addition to the Hofstra Cultural Center, um, the Association of Italian American Educators for their support over the years, and the President Cavaliere Josephine Maeta, and also I see some friends from the Long Island Regional Chapter of the Italian American Studies Association. I also want to welcome a couple of my students I see. Uh, I'm teaching a course on Italian American history this semester, and I welcome them. Um, those of you that are new, uh, you probably came to us through the Cultural Center. So if you have not uh, registered with them for the mailing list, please do so. Uh, and you can join us on other events, not just in the Italian American lecture series, okay? Um, so uh, also one other thing, it might be best if uh, those of you that are watching put your uh, screens on speaker view. Uh, that will then allow you to see the images in a better uh, mode, okay? So this afternoon, we are fortunate to have with us William Bill Papaleo, an American artist who has lived and worked in Italy for over 35 years. His paintings and his work have been exhibited in museums and galleries in Europe, around the United States. Uh, he's received various awards uh, internationally, nationally in the United States. His work has appeared in jury shows in Italy, in America. Uh, presently, he is represented by the Wolf, uh, Wolf Art Galleries in Washington and Massachusetts. Uh, he has collaborated with the Royal College of Art in London, uh, the University in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, he has taught painting and art at the University of California. He has taught art and painting in Naples and also uh, at the Castle Hill Center for the Arts in Truro, Massachusetts. Uh, he studied in New York City at the Cape School of Art in Massachusetts. Uh, in Italy, he studied at, at the Accademia di Belle Arti in Naples, and he has even a, su a subspecialty in uh, church fresco technique uh, after studying with Antonio Montagna in Piemonte. Uh, I also, on a personal note, want to thank uh, and uh, in, in introduce Bill, uh, uh, and because he warmly welcomed me in Naples several years ago, where well, we had a memorable lunch with Fred Gardafe, who was distinguished professor of English and Italian American studies at Queens College. Uh, because Fred Gardafe has written about Bill's work, I have asked Fred to speak after uh, Bill's presentation and before the Q&A. And since I see in the audience, John Domini, also from Naples and an intimate connection with Naples, 
I'm going to ask John to speak also at the end of the formal presentation after Fred and before the Q&A because John has a memoir about growing up in Naples that is coming out uh, very soon. Um, so, uh, so that's the roadmap for this evening. Bill will present his work. Uh, Fred Godfrey will give a couple of comments. John Domini will give a couple of comments and then we'll have a Q&A. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat uh, and we'll address them at the end. If there's a particular painting or image that you want to ask a question about, please make note of it. Please make note of the name, the title, and we Bill can easily get back to it in the Q&A. Okay, so if that's all of the housekeeping, then I would like to extend a warm invitation to Bill Papaleo. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, I also want to thank Hofstra and particularly uh, Professor Pugliese, Stanislaw Pugliese, and Carol Mallison for helping me to uh, get this thing on the road. Okay, so what I'd like to do, because I think it'd be more interesting, is I will take you uh, through uh, my life, the past 35 years, through my paintings. So it will we'll go on a voyage together here through the paintings. And um, but uh, okay, I'll, I'll talk mainly about ideas and and how they influence me and uh, my various influences. But um, if anybody later wants to ask specifically about technique, um, I can talk about that as well. Um, okay, first of all, why? Why did I? Why did I do this? Why did I? leave America and come to Italy um, in 35 years ago. Uh, partly um, was influenced by my father, which I'll get to in a moment, but it was also in 1983 when I first came here, I had been studying some of the Mexican masters like Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, Orozco, and I was fascinated by their magic realism. However, not being Mexican, I felt it was more authentic to, to understand what, what uh, something of that kind of thing that was in myself. And when I knew that Naples, because I had lived there as a child with my father for a year, I knew that something about that was attracting me and calling me like an unconscious memory. Um, and so uh, I started, I didn't, what I didn't want to do was, um, paint uh, like the 19th century painters of, from England who were the grand tour. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but what they would do, they would already have sketches of Italy before they came. They already had a preconceived notion of it. And um, they would arrive and then color it in and then bring it back. So there was no real seeing and experiencing and understanding. Uh, it was already just sort of reinforced stereotypes and concept. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to really see it as a new thing for, because for me, it was a new thing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, I wanna go backwards and talk a little bit about my father. Um, this is him laughing. Uh, remember this image because later I'm gonna to get to Toto and talk about the spirit of Naples. And there's something that reminds me of my father and, and Toto. And my father actually interviewed Toto uh, in the 1950s. Um, but there's also, uh, okay, um, I'll go to my father in, when he was only 20, in, when he was only 22, he was working with um, W.H. Uh, Auden. Auden had a lot of uh, belief in him as a poet. He first started as a poet, he later became a novelist, he wrote many short stories. I don't know how many people are familiar with him, but some people consider him sort of a, a grandfather to some of the Italian American writers today because he was one of the first to talk about Italian Americans without guns, without the mafia. He, he was writing about his experience. And what he realized was that um, he was writing just, he thought about his family in the Bronx, but then he realized he was writing about a generation of Italian Americans. He realized it was something bigger. Uh, and what Fred Gardafe, uh, Professor Gardafe really helped me understand um, it, when he started writing about my father and then about me is that we were two poles, we we're two different uh, examples of being Italian American. Uh, whereas he had this sense of inferiority uh, and a sense of, this, of the immigrant, the, the common immigrant experience where um, actually uh, when I went to Italy, it was completely new. I didn't have that baggage. I wanted to see it as something new. Anyway, let's get back to my father and this poem. I'll read it for a second. <clears throat> this is with under Auden's influence. Um, Gracious moon, I come again in anguish to admire you. 
You follow the ship whose hopeful ones dreamed of a golden trip to a golden city. Did you see me disappear within a frame house for my adopted years? When did you see the metamorphosis of me? When children mocked my halted speech? If they could see reflected in your light how we were young together by olive trees, skies that defy remembering. Okay, and that's a, a sort of a precursor. And then he began to write uh, a lot of short stories about Italian Americans and always this, this difficulty of integration um, into uh, society. Um, and uh, although, you know, his writings were always working on this goal and he was happy when Italian Americans succeeded and stuff. I always felt that this, this road to freedom in America, in fact, there was something that I didn't quite believe uh, because I, there was something in him that I could see didn't quite believe in it. Uh, in, in fact, in one poem, he says, we will not sail. Unknown, we have no voyages left, only the memory of the sword that left the stone and left the air and carved this home we cannot own. So that feeling of, of that we can't quite uh, own this, it's, it's we're still visitors, uh, that, that, that immigrant element. Um, so there's both the nostalgia and that image of not being in one place or the other. And I continued this in a different way. I did everything backwards, everything the opposite. I came to Italy and here is an image um, that uh, Fred Gardefe mentioned this he talked it called it making Naples. I became a name for a show that I did in uh, a castle in Piazza uh, Municipio, the castle in Piazza Municipio, and there was a retrospective of my work there. And these were three. Um, I was painting an atmospheric study because I had studied with uh, impressionists in America, um, and I was working on that. And then these three Nigerians came by, and they were in fact the middle one is looking at my watercolors, and. Um, I realized suddenly as I stepped back that they were the story, they were the painting. And from there, I began my interest in interviewing and understanding this new uh, element of metamorphosis of integration. Um, uh, also, there's some things that Fred Gardefe that had written that really profoundly affected me after he saw my work and he had been writing in general about Italian Americans. There's some pretty strong words here. I just will write, uh, quote a little bit. Um, he was mentioning how Italian Americans have become invisible the moment they could pass themselves off as white. And since they have gone to great extremes to avoid being identified as anything but white, they have hid, hidden the history of being people of color. It could be added that Italian Americans have a political, cultural, and historical amnesia. Um, Gardefe continues um, uh, talking about how Italian Americans becomes white on a leash uh, as they accept the media except um, that they don't identify with other minorities. Um, and and they, they feel they will be allowed to remain white. This, um, and this behavior, he mentions, has, has led Italian Americans to be left out of the discussions of multiculturalism. Um, and so this, 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 these various writings, Fred can elaborate if he wants to later, um, but it really helped my understanding of where I was at in Italy at this moment in time. And, uh, also, also, he mentioned Robert Biscusi, who said that Italians can no longer wait for attitudes to, for, of their heritage to change, okay? He was talking of Italian Americans in America, but they must change the attitudes themselves. He states, while earlier generations battles were fought and won on the economic front, the battle for the grandchildren of the immigrants has moved to the cultural front. And so that's exactly when I read those words, that, uh, that's exactly where I hope to be. And uh, I hope to be a part of that a transformational battle um, <clears throat> for uh, a new, a, a greater, wider, vaster sense of what identity is and understanding. Okay, let's go back for a moment um, to this first image, <clears throat> which is called Immigrants and Emigrants. Um, this is now an Italian American Museum in Los Angeles, but um, this was, uh, we were working on a multimedia show of uh, theater and music and where we were understanding the Italians, that the things that were happening to the immigrants in Italy were exactly what was happening, uh, had happened to Italians in America. And so I just worked on this theme and saw what came out and some of the images is this ghost of Vanzetti who I feel, figured was a key figure in this because my father had been working a lot on the story of Vanzetti never succeeded completely, uh, 
but he was, saw him as a key because when Vanzetti was killed, it created a shock, a trauma in Italian American community. And, and I think that's one of the reasons that Italians changed their name. They wanted to fit in at all costs. And that's uh, something that my generation was freed from. And now we're culturally trying to understand the richness, the beauty and the, and the powerful heritage that we have. Whereas no, we're not trying to fit in anymore. We're trying to understand. And so we're, we're getting vaster in the, the bigger discussion of what identity is and what a cultural identity is. Um, in the upper right hand corner, you'll see uh, my grandmother uh, from Salerno, um, who was very mystical and uh, also was like my great grandmother, who my father wrote a story about called Nonna, which was, uh, who was also very mystical. She was black, black, very dark skinned uh, Calabrian, um, who uh, spoke only in rhyme. And the Italian American family was very embarrassed by that her. But uh, my father found her totally fascinating because I think it inspired him to be a poet as a matter of fact, because everything, and this is a tradition in Italy that's not as well known, but for example, in the middle ages when there was a lot of uh, illiteracy, um, many of the cures were written in rhyme so people could remember. Uh, so whatever the herb was, or was it oregano or whatever, they had a rhyme and then talked about its, its calming elements to the stomach. So, um, these, uh, this was fascinating to me, this, this female element that, uh, female archaic element that, that I felt existed and does still exist. You can find it in pockets. And uh, it was something in general, something in me and something I think that exists in Italian American that is, is a very powerful uh, uh, element that uh, inspired me and has, and comes into various images in my work. Um, okay. Um, then, okay, after, uh, okay, as we saw this, this image here, we're looking above uh, Naples. These are these workers bringing bricks and we're seeing we're above the Centro Storico. It goes, this is a large painting. It goes back to the, the modern part, but the, the old is more present than the new. And so that I noticed. And uh, so that's, that, was, that was part of this image. And now we're going from above to below, and now we're in the Centro Storico, which you saw before, and this is the beginning so also of uh, these African immigrants are beginning to enter into the picture literally and uh, metaphorically. Okay, um, and then we're right into the bowels of, of the Centro Storico now. Here we're in Spacanapoli, right directly, we're grounded, and this moment I had been, uh, as I said, I had done some work in America and I taught how to paint uh, dark figures against the light because it was a it was a technique simply to understand color and form through color. Okay, and I was walking down the street uh, and I heard this man, this Nigerian man named Ken, who was singing a, a gospel African American song. And suddenly we hit, we talked, and we started talking. He started told me his whole story of uh, his transformation and his his voyage and his difficulties. You can see a little bit here. I won't go too into detail because I have a long story that's really like a biblical uh, um, voyage. But if you look here, you can see the words, the church where my family worships was firebombed by Muslim extremists. Members of my family were killed. I had bad burns on my legs where now there were bad scars. I decided to leave my country for a better life and work. When we arrived in Sicily, the fishermen tried to sink our boat. The Coast Guard saved us. Many immigrants are coming. They have talent and abilities. Their talents are wasted. There must be a return to giving. And he had he spoke in almost poetic terms also. Everything was so powerful, so clear. Um, and uh, there's one moment, he doesn't mention this, but when he was in Mali get, getting further towards Libya, he was walking through the desert. He saw friends of his dead and then suddenly he saw footprints. And he said, and they told him to follow the footprints. He continued to follow the footprints, and then the footprints disappeared. So at that point, he just went on faith. He, he continued and uh, made it to Libya, started working there, and get, then got on one of those terrible boats and made it to Italy. The story ends happily. He did meet a friend of mine from the university. They married and left to Germany. He now is working in Germany and he's doing well. So, uh, but this is, this, he, he really opened me to a lot of interesting elements of, Africa and a sort of an unconscious kind of way of thinking about things. Uh, and if you notice under, 
uh, over his head, that's a Greek column uh, that's part of a medieval church in the Centro Storico. Uh, so what I liked about Naples um, is that I always had the feeling I was seeing like 10 centuries all at the same time with a modern motorcycle coming by, boom, sort of Fellini once mentioned if it, uh, all he needed was the, the Colosseum and a traffic jam and he could, he could do the rest. I mean, Italy's full of those kind of images. Um, okay, this uh, is a vicolo that uh, in Naples, um, a little a vicolo means small, small town, a small a road, uh, thin road. And I remember always coming by, it used to smell the smell of sugo, and now I smell curries. And I don't know if it was the curry or what, but I just, as I saw this quick image, the, the church at the end of the thing seemed, some had an element of an Indian element of like a mandala or something. But anyway, the whole thing, uh, also the mixture, the mix of, of culture and, and the feeling of being at home in Naples uh, mixed uh, together for me and, and this produced this painting. Okay, um, Napoli collage. Okay, unveiling layers. This is a large painting. It's about uh, five feet by four feet. Um, it's uh, various images of the Centro Storico. Um, we see uh, on top uh, what's called Il Corpo di Napoli, which is the body of Naples, which is the name of this sculpture. It's a sculpture that they that is actually a Greek sculpture that's right in the center of the Centro Storico. Just out in front of a bar, people have coffees and <laughs> take pictures of it. And they thought it was a Venus or an Aphrodite because there was a child, a, a baby that was sort of next to it and, and Zeus is holding on. Uh, then later they found the head of Zeus and, none, and they realized that this was a Zeus. And it's an interesting uh, a patriarchal, it's a, it's a, it's a father um, image of, with a child and that you don't often see that in art. Uh, this, this down here, uh, among the various images of motorcycles and street violinists and things, under here is, is the veiled Christ that's in the San Severo church, uh, which are some amazing, amazing, great sculptures that are worth, always worth seeing. If you ever get to Italy, that's, it's a church you must go to, though there are long lines. Now. And the, the veiled Christ, what's interesting, I began to do some study of it, is all these, there's various veiled Christ and veiled images, and it's all about veiled consciousness. Uh, and the, the guy, although was considered sort of an evil wizard, but probably was a philosopher. And he was uh, fascinated by uh, this, this consciousness, the idea of thought as having, uh, that we are only seeing a part of what is reality. And uh, that's the way I feel when I walk through the streets of Naples. I always feel like every time I think I know it, something else appears and there's another veil that, that uh, comes apart. And so that's, uh, that was my image there. And always, always in the streets is always the sacred imagery that is always, always coming in the middle of the soot and the grime and the dirt. You always seem to see it. Uh, okay, this is an image from the door of Pio Monte della Misericordia. It's outside the church, the church where one of the greatest Caravaggio, the seven acts of mercy is. And I just opened the doors, came out of the church and boom, this is what hit me. This very potent image of feminine image uh, that was on part of this uh, obelisk. And then this poor old woman that was down here and this strong light and dark contrast. It just, it just struck me. And you know, it's one of those things that, that hit, I could not paint it. Uh, again, Retefilo, Napoli. This is a really busy, dirty, crazy, noisy street. But uh, I was, again, like I mentioned with Fellini, you know, it just the, the fact of this modern rush and then always a sacred image in, inside it at the same time that, uh, that struck me. Here's another in the Centro Storico. Um, this is uh, a vicolo that is a part of the Centro. And the Centro Storico, I don't know if you know it, um, but uh, it is built on the same grid as the Greeks, the ancient Greeks made it. And if you look closely into this picture and you see some of the women and men that are in through the windows hanging over, and you go to Pompeii or Herculaneum, you'll see basically the same kinds of structures. They had these little half doors and the people come out, either they sell things and the, the life is, you know that there's, a, there's a, an unbroken line from ancient Greece into, even though things have uh, 
been contaminated and, and messed with and uh, uh, the walls seem to be falling apart all, at all the times. But in this, this is late August light, things seem to melt together. And uh, again, that kind of unconscious imagery of, uh, of all the centuries working at the same time to me is, uh, is always inspires me. Uh, lastly, in, in Naples, is, uh, you can't understand Naples, I don't think, if you don't see Toto and get to know Toto. Uh, my mother, who was Anglo-Saxon, loved Toto because she was a modern dancer and just watched his movement. She didn't understand anything he was saying, but she would go hysterical just by watching him. Uh, Toto is, um, is also in direct line, even though uh, he was very modern, and uh, he, uh, with the Commedia dell'arte, um, he... Uh, my father interviewed him at the, at, in the 50s, I think, um, and he was sort of surprised because Toto was such a man of the people and things. At the time, though, he played a role with my father. He was looking in the mirror all the time, checking his tie, and he talked only about the fact that he was a prince, il principe. And my father was sort of a little bit nonplussed by the whole thing, but later I started to read that actually it was true. Although he was... Uh, an illegitimate child in a very poor section of Naples, actually a street I lived on for a while. Um, he, his real father had royal blood and he was a, a principe. And, but Neapolitans know him as il principe della risata, which is the, the prince of laughter. And uh, this painting is in, I watched a, uh, one of his movies about a thousand times in order to do this painting. It was when he is a musician who uh, is a composer and any kind of noise or sound that comes in uh, that people try to distract, he just immediately hears and he turns into, ah, okay. And he turns it into a song or, or, or uh, an orchestrated music. And um, people go crazy. They try, to just, they try to get his attention, but he's always turning it into music. And I thought there's a perfect metaphor for the artist. Finally, I don't know if you see these angry faces up on the top. There's this Italian American politician who comes in expecting, full of pride, expecting to be uh, honored and everything. And um, Toto is the orchestrator and he continues to play the music a little lower so the politicians begin to speak. And then he, boom, puts all the music at high level and uh, completely drives the politician out of his mind. Um, and it's a, it's, a wonderful, it's, it's a wonderful movie. I suggest you get to know Toto if you don't already know him. He, and back to my father's laughter uh, and spirit of Yes, and the improvisational yes, and and Toto, I I relate a lot to it. I, I enjoy that uh, element of Naples. I think it's one of the best parts of what Naples is. And to understand that, you can get to know if you're if you let go of your guard and you start to, and you're in Naples and things get fresh. You just realize, just take it and and go and 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 you'll have a good time. This is uh, a different, whole different element of Naples. I was walking. Uh, through one part, it's really in the center, but nobody knows about this. It's called the Santa Anna de Lombardi Church. Um, and it has these incredibly perfectly intact frescoes. They've re, re, uh, restored them uh, of Vasari. Vasari is more known for Florence. He taught Leonardo da Vinci had, and he wrote about the lives of uh, the artists, but he spent, as all good artists did in the various, from the Giotto onwards, they, they spent some time in Naples. And, um, then I met this guy from Sri Lanka who was sort of guarding the church. He was, I guess, for a few coins from the priest, he was, had this job of just taking care that everything was okay. And uh, this mixture of things, and I got to know him a little bit, I talked with him a bit, uh, just, he, he brought, strangely enough, uh, he brought it, uh, again, I could relate to something in him and I don't know, uh, and the imagery, was whirling in my head like a again like an Indian mandala and uh, again also we have this child because I always think of Naples is a child and he's protecting both the saints and he's protecting the child and I that that whole imagery came to me and uh, that's how this was produced. We were back uh, to a harsher reality. This was fortunately is no longer this way but many years ago when I started working with the Senegalese when I was working with Amnesty International uh, I started to live and sketch with them. I was in the curb sort of sketching and they were on the run from the police all the time. I didn't understand because it was illegal to sell anything uh, if you were an immigrant, if you didn't have the right papers and things. So if you see the nervousness in his shoulders and this guy with his umbrella, they're checking to see the police. If the police come, they 
take their bags and their little items that they made a few uh, coins on and, and they'd have to run somewhere else. Now, fortunately, the Senegalese are, are politically uh, um, organized and they have a, their own space and things are a lot better, at least for the Senegalese. I don't know about the other immigrant things are still, it's still tough, it's still tough in Italy. Um, but they have created some political power in the town of Salerno. Um, this is another image of them. Uh, I just was struck by the light and the, and the sort of the graciousness of their, their posture and there's a certain regalness. Um, this was a reflection on those that don't make it because we think about, you know, we know about the American dream and the joy, but you know, it just suddenly I had as a meditating on uh, all these people that, that never made it. Um, and that's how this painting came about. And this woman's face struck me. Um, intensity. This is called Survivors. Again, I, I do direct work, direct um, interviews, and then things just come out of my head uh, as I let the images that I've worked with and all the other images just come together. Um, and uh, I remember one of these guys who he had interviewed him for one of the faces in the, in the painting, and he just talked about the fear. I, for, I didn't realize fully, you know, you get through the voyage, you get to the town, and then suddenly you're sort of hated when you get there. And, and the level of fear, of just everyday fear, I, I, I realized that that was the most difficult thing. Um, and uh, also, um, the, you, know, the, the, you know, how does that affect integration? I don't know if that's really understood. What, you know, that, that element, that psychological element of fear, what, what point, how, how much does that influence us? Even as generation, even as Italians, you know, the fear, we don't, we may even have elements of what happened in the time of Sacco and Vanzetti, who knows what, what that does to us. Um, and the other more positive element here is this uh, back to the Corpo di Napoli comes again through and uh, there's Zeus and the child and, um, and it's cornucopia. Zeus has a cornucopia of fruit and, and I was thinking of the wealth, the wealth of, of all these immigrants and the wealth of Naples and and then another thing, strange enough, there was a there was a space that they couldn't find. They found this other sculpture that was part of this sculpture, which is a sphinx from Egypt. And somehow it made sense to me that that uh, Naples, the sphinx, turn returns to the body of Naples. That that struck in my head. I don't know. Um, and so that sort of uh, was part of what what uh, this completion, because basically, in a sense, that is my voyage. Trying to as as I as I walk through and paintings come into my mind, you know, what are we doing as we dream, as we paint, as we write, we're, we're putting together all those fragments of ourselves to make uh, and to find a, a sort of a wholeness. Uh, and as you do a, a portrait, um, you're finding a part of yourself in that person. Um, this was a woman from Kyrgyzstan uh, that, um, that uh, posed for me from, from the university. Uh, she had a ter terrible life. Um, she, was a devout Muslim and I uh, was interested in um, Sufism and Rumi. And so she trusted me and she, uh, she uh, told me her story, which was horrendous. She had been uh, kid almost kidnapped and forced to marry. Um, she managed to escape Kyrgyzstan and uh, uh, she had been tortured by her father who was an alcoholic and um, she managed to get out and now she lives happily married in Turkey. She still, she and her husband would like to come to Italy because Italy is sort of the Mecca for many of the third world. And we don't think about it that way, but now Italy has become sort of the uh, America for the third world in a way. And so she's hoping to come to Italy again with her husband. Um, but uh, she, she, um, she survived the, uh, I remember she survived her, um, kidnapping by saying to them, okay, you can kidnap me and you can marry me, but I'll make your life a living hell. And she, <laughs> the guy got too scared. She was a very powerful woman anyway. Uh, and she, she survived and uh, is, is doing okay. Um, now uh, let's go back to Italy, um, Italians who I also interviewed. Um, this is Maria from I, I met her, this woman, again, sort of this archetypal, powerful women that, that, that the South uh, has still, you know, that, that seemed to, they could, seems like even if there was an earthquake, they could put their feet down and, and keep the, the earth together. Uh, 
And um, I met her as I was doing some landscapes in, uh, in the olive orchards. And here she says, I've been working, picking olives all my life. I'm 75. Maybe I'll take a vacation soon. I've never had a vacation. I'm strong and in perfect health. The young ones find it hard, but I've always done this. I've never had a problem uh, with this work. The new owners will destroy these olive groves. They are rich. They don't appreciate what is here. Unfortunately, that part was prophetic. She, uh, um, she actually, uh, um, she uh, was right. And the, the owners and the wealthy landowners actually did destroy the land. And, uh, but she also, like many Southerners that I met, had a, a true um, sense of the immigrant. And because she was also a migrant worker, she occasionally worked in other parts, but she, she had a, a understanding and acceptance um, in her that was, I thought, the genuine spirit of Italians. Okay, um, this is success from Nigeria. Uh, he uh, gave me a very quick lesson. I did a quick sketch of him at, uh, in the evening on the Lungomare of Salerno. And he gave me in two, two sentences, a political science lesson, because I really didn't understand Libya and what was happening and all the things you hear about Hillary, all these things, I didn't understand anything. But suddenly on a human soul to soul level, I understood. Because here he says in two sentences, when the Americans started bombing Libya, the Muslims started killing Christians. I had to escape to Salerno. I believe God will help me find a job. And that just struck in my head. It helped me do the portrait because uh, I started seeing the human level of what, what we, you know, we think we hear all these pros and cons of, of uh, foreign policy, but when you see face to face the person and you know what's happening, it's a whole nother world. And so this was also a transformational uh, a moment. Uh, Jabril down in Paestum, we're now going south, uh, south of Salerno, we're going towards the Greek town of Paestum. Uh, he was a wonderful man that he runs the Lega Ambiente, which means the uh, environmental uh, organization protecting uh, the environment in, in, in Paestum. And here his, his words speak for themselves. Everything can be gained from the earth. My mother always said, we belong to the earth. It will feed us. Uh, my boat from Libya had 190 people. We almost all died. I can't return to Senegal. The Northern rebels would kill me. I hope to bring my wife and children here. He has created his own garden. He's self, pretty much self-sufficient. He shares his foods with other people. And this, this image, uh, being in Paestum also, and with him, it just became iconic to me. Um, here is Paestum. Here we are in the temple. If you ever get a chance, there are moments, there are times when you can actually go into the temples, the Greek temples in Paestum. And I, if you haven't been there, I advise you to go when you can go when it, uh, late evening because the light comes in. I think the Greeks must have been conscious of this. Uh, they were, the way they plan their architecture and, uh, and the light comes in a certain kind. It seems to be absorbed by the columns and it just, everything just glows. And this uh, late glow was uh, always, it's inspired me to do a couple of paintings. And actually the temples were universities. Uh, each one uh, taught a different school of philosophy. Okay, this is another quick sketch, a pastel sketch that I did uh, working for the others. Okay, um, back to these work I had done again, another model. Uh, this was a giant guy from uh, Mustafa from Senegal who was quite wealthy, a very different world. He had a rich father, he was legal, he was doing fine and uh, always laughing. And uh, he, his laughter just sort of uh, shook the sky. Uh, another situation. Uh, this woman, um, uh, was, it was Woman's Day and I was asked to do a portrait of this woman. We got to know each other um, and she revealed, you know, she didn't want to offend the Italians because she was appreciated what she had. But at the same time, I could see the ra racism was, was heavy on her. Uh, and um, she really had that longing to go back. And she, was, she mentioned she was happy that her daughter was learning equal rights and that she was more accepted as a woman who did things independently, whereas in Seneca, it wasn't true, but I could tell she just had such deep longing to return home. That uh, is, I guess, a universal, it, it happens to many, many immigrants. Uh, now we're going again to a factory. Uh, this is a commission I had uh, to, to work with the shipbuilders, uh, Castellamare, another whole new world that takes away all, you know, preconceived notions I had of Italians or workers, and incredibly hard workers. The Southerners are always considered to be 
uh, lazy, you know, and, but uh, these guys were working incredibly hard and incredibly difficult. This is um, hundreds of feet up in the air, working, uh, doing a sketch of this guy here, uh, holding onto his cross, so to speak. Um, and we're hundreds of yards above the, the city and they build ships from the top down. And uh, here's another image of the shipbuilders. This is a two meter by 180 centimeter giant. Uh, I guess that's about seven, six and a half feet. Uh, it's a large painting that I was given and it's a wax and oil mixture. Uh, and you'll see the, the worker up on the top sort of hanging on and bringing it in and building. And this, this, uh, this town still still is building. It's still it's had a lot of political problems uh, because they they don't get enough for some political reasons. Uh, they they missed out on a lot of contracts and things, and uh, they've had a protest. They went all up. A friend of mine who commissioned me uh, mentioned that all the guys went up, 150 of them, you know, to protest. And but they're very sweet guys. They're they're politically intelligent. They're well read, but they're not smart about politics the, the in in kind of politics and uh the 150 guys went up there and they didn't have any reason they didn't know what they were going to say and uh my friend said well, you've got to have something to say we're meeting the most important politicians of italy you have to have some demands and they said well we just thought it was important to be here you know and uh my friend ruminated and ruminated on that and then when we i had my show in there was a gallery and a museum that they made for the workers there that was he used it as a metaphor for what i did there i was that the important is to be to be present sometimes it's you know you don't know what the end is but the important to be present with a person whether you're doing a portrait a landscape be present in that moment and things come uh and he and they were all very pleased that i had given this attention because the southerners feel invisible uh and you know that they are doing all these things, and, and yet the same stereotypes that we found in America are also in the sub, in southern Italy. Uh, here's one a pastel watercolor I was in the ship, and you give us I don't know if that gives a sense of the size, but you see him sort of soldering, soldering his cross there, uh, and the smoke is coming up. And then another one working. Uh... Okay, now out of the factories into the Amalfi Coast. Uh, this is a town called Cetara. It's from Cetus, and I think it, it, it means whale in, in Latin, I'm not sure, but it's a, it's a tuna fishing town and uh, also a fresh alishi, fresh uh, sardines that they, they do a lot of. Uh, and this is where I created with Sarah Lawrence College a, a, work, a writing and painting workshop, and we work in the castle. Uh, of the town, they've given us the castle, and hopefully, uh, we will return to this after COVID is gone. We can continue uh, doing workshops there. Um, okay, and this is from the sea. Uh, another, we mentioned we uh, we uh, in this town again. This is a scene of fishermen working in the town, uh, and this was a moment I found very profound. Um, these are men, all men, fathers and sons, gen different generations, all working and mending the nets. And uh, what was fascinating to me is that it's all done in silence. They knew exactly what they had to do. Obviously, something that goes back generations and generations and generations. And they just all worked in total silence and in, in silent movement. And it, it, in fact, they were also men. It was like a dance, and yet uh, it was this ancient tradition. And um, it moved me a lot, and I, I painted that. Um, I even behind me, I don't know if you see if I'm working on another version of a, of a more intimate version of a father and son. Uh, synchronistically, the Sarah Lawrence program is called the Joe Papaleo Writers and, and Painting uh, Workshop. So it, uh, it seems to come full circle. Um, here are some women uh, working in a factory in Vietri. Vietri is known uh, for ceramics. It's a strange situation. You have uh, people working uh, and ceramics and like an industrial level, but all by hand. Everything is handmade, everything's hand decorated. Uh, and I've, I've worked with them. And if you're an artist or uh, you come, they, they invite you in and they often let you, let you work and then they, then they copy you, but that's okay. And uh, I've, but they let you do, uh, and, and they've gotten more experimental now, finally, and they're doing more artistic uh, stuff. So we've, it's a, it's a, a, a font of uh, inspiration, but also of materials for work. And uh, 
So it's very interesting what you can do with ceramics. It's like a, a traveling fresco to me because you could work very, very large and, ca and uh, travel with it in small pieces and then they become big pieces. Uh, this is Amalfi. This is a woman who grows hot peppers, uh, makes dishes with hot pepper, and also makes these necklaces with hot peppers. It just is an image that struck me. Uh, here we're back in the sea looking at the Amalfi Coast. And it reminded me to mention that, you know, uh, a lot of people have mentioned that Turner um, uh, first started on the Amalfi Coast uh, when he changed his color sense. He, he, in a sense, is the first impressionist. He didn't have the materials, um, but he, um, he didn't have the materials of the impressionist, but he did start seeing uh, life through color as opposed to um, as opposed to simply line. This is Villa Eva um, and it is in Ravello. This is above the Rondinaia where Gorbidal has a big villa and this is the whole Amalfi Coast. And I remember when I look at this picture I always think of my father's line, skies that defy remembering. Um, I worked on uh, many sketches in Ravello, and uh, this was a uh, memory work that's a very large painting that I think is now in a bill in Long Island, of all places, a rock star bought it. Um, okay. Uh, whenever I do these big landscape paint, there's always a part I feel I have to come back in order to sort of earn the right to be in the landscape. I always feel I have to sort of gr get grounded and see also the hard work that goes into uh, what what makes the landscape. And um, so here we uh, see some of the workers um, going down the mountain. Uh, okay, and they're carrying lemons and the lemons, uh, there's a very, very difficult work there. Their muscles, if you look at the calf muscles, the muscles themselves look like two lemons. Um, here again, these were lemon workers coming up from the sea up into the mountain bringing, and they were very happy uh, when they heard I was gonna bring this painting to America. They were still had that innocence that you find in the South sometimes still about America. They say, ah, we're going to America. Even though it was just a, their image that was going to America, they were still pleased that they were going to America. Uh, this is a procession of San Giovanni in Vietri. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, a mixture, always these, these processions are also fascinating because there's always a mixture of pagan in the good sense of just uh, so something very felt and archaic. And then there's San Giovanni in the distance, San Antonio actually, I think that's San Antonio with a child and San Giovanni is somewhere else. And all the people are going crazy. They're eating food, they're making noise, they're hitting their children, the children are hitting their mothers and the guy is uh, filming it all. And all of this under this, these skies that uh, are sort of the real spiritual part of things. Um, but it's, it's interesting, I, these juxtapositions of these, these, uh, these skies that are so uh, beatific and then the earthly reality that's uh, just chaos, but a, but a good chaos <laughs> and a warm chaos. This, this unifies the town a great deal. When you see these people, when you're part of it, even if you don't believe in anything, you're just walking through the town, uh, you can't help but feel part of the people. It's these, these things are important that way for the unity of the town. Um, now we're going to um, the Capelli di Venere, which is in the Cilento coast. We're finally heading to Cilento coast. And this is a waterfall, which is called Aphrodite's or Venere's a waterfall. Um, it's the hair of Aphrodite, the hair of Venus. Um, and I was doing some of these, these sketches uh, in oils of these of the area from life. Uh, here's another picture of the Cavelli Venice. It's, it's the purest, uh, the purest parts of Italy, especially the south. And uh, this is a very clean water. It's drinkable and uh, it's amazing a land that's still unspoiled. Um, and this got me to thinking about the mythological element of it. And I was invited to uh, do some paintings uh, based on this theme of Mater Mondi and Aphrodite. Uh, the theme, the Mater Mondi was the goddess of Vibonati, um, who, uh, okay, who, um, 
is seen here and it is it had one waterfall in Fibonacci where there's one water. And then the Aphrodite is the goddess of Casaleta Spartana, which is the waterfall you saw painted before. And they met at this waterfall because the people of Fibonacci, as the myth goes, uh, were becoming infertile. And so uh, Aphrodite had to come to uh, Matermondi, who was the goddess of this other town, and offer her the fertility cure, um, which was made of the liqueur of goat's milk, honey, and wine in the waterfall. They, she had to drink this in the water, and then she would be fertile. So all these images of this undisturbed nature, uh, this female element that you know is so necessary to return to on the archetypal and unconscious level, uh, and this this sense of you know respect, like Jabril told us, talked to us about you know everything can come from the earth. This seemed to be the moment to paint this, and I, I worked on on these, uh, and I was invited again to paint a fresco, sort of fresco, called a graffito multistrato in Montemuro on the same theme. This is a technique that uh, they put uh, various um, colors in, sort of cemented in. And as, as they're drying, I worked uh, to scratch through the colors. And the whole town is covered with frescoes. Uh, and they invite artists to come and work. Uh, these are the cork trees. This is a town. Um, it's I call it abundance and simplicity. It's 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 where we're doing some workshops. I hope to do a workshop on painting and myth here. Um, and this this town here, uh, Bibonati and the difference. Uh, 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 there's a various there's a B and B which is known as Il Sugaro, which means the cork tree. And I've been invited to do some workshops there. And I hope someday maybe we'll uh, when this uh, nightmare is over we can we can we can be there and uh, and work there. And okay, uh, they hope to make some cultural um, initiatives there because they have a, a, a really um, uh, a nature that is is sustainable and workable. And now they they want to have a cultural element as well. It seems ideal to me. Um, this is the town of Bibonati uh, from a Palazzo Vecchio, which also invites artists to um, have to show their work and also sometimes do residencies. And uh, I did this pastel from there. I'm having a show there as well. This is a give you an idea of how, how pure this area is. This is the Cilento, uh, just completely undisturbed on, on uh, and I, I, I never thought there'd be so much green uh, in this area. The town, the, towards the sea, things have been more built up because it's, it's more uh, known. Again, this pure nature. Uh, the coast to Maratea, that is where um, uh, I'm, I'm going to the town of Maratea. This is another part of uh, my future. There's a gallery there that I'm going to be showing, and I'm showing now. now. Um, then Stan, Stanislaw Pagese, he asked me to mention how did uh, the COVID crisis affect my artwork? And so I thought I'd just show a few things while I was in lockdown, what happened. I worked with some students on a multimedia show of The Tempest, where we did it, and I offered them this, this image. We were working on The Tempest of Shakespeare, and during this, and The Tempest became a metaphor also for COVID. And so, uh, again, I was thinking of this, this image of the catastrophe, and then of this female element of this return to the earth, and represented by Ariel and Miranda. Uh, this is the winter storm covering the beach and the villas of Chitara. And again, this was something I've been meditating on since the COVID, once the COVID crisis, we're going to, this is something we also have to deal with. And this wonderful town, this beach and the villas are completely covered. But in the catastrophe, there's also a lot of beauty because the seas are becoming incredibly clean. There's all these, uh, there's dolphins coming back to the Amalfi Coast. It's, uh, so hopefully we can preserve that. Uh, this is from my house. Uh, again, I had to spend a lot of time in my house, but fortunately I have a balcony that looks over at the Amalfi Coast and some of the Chilento Coast. Um, so these are some of the things I've been doing. Mountains of Raito, this is also from uh, my town and my, my actually from, right from my house. And again, here I was able to walk out a little bit. At first we were totally locked down, then I was able to come up into the mountains uh, and above Raito, this is a Raito from above, 
It's the path to the Monte Monte Latari. The Monte Latari are what are called the Milk Mountains. I always like that that, that image. Um, but because there's a lot of cows and goats in certain parts, uh, they create good cheese, and and so it's the spine of the Amalfi Coast. It actually um, uh, is is on top of the Amalfi Coast, that, and so uh, there's a whole another world that exists there, that's undisturbed and beautiful. And you get a sense of this as I was walking up the mountains, and I met this uh, man and mule, <laughs> and this is a watercolor on the Amalfi paper which is a special kind of paper they make in Amalfi that uh, has been made in the same way they've done since the 16th century. Uh, you can order it if you're an artist and interested in, they do also for invitations for weddings and things. It's a very, very beautiful paper. And this is finally hitting home. This is where, again, right nearby, this is where I'd like to invite everybody to come someday. Uh, they make an organic wine in this wine tasting and they do wine tasting and they're hoping to do workshops, theater and music. And so, and it'll all be out, outside. So even if there's some COVID problems, we can still, we can still do things. Um, so this is a hope for the future. And I'm working there doing de demonstrations. This is a gray day painting demonstration. Uh, and finally this, I offer you this, uh, the apricot blossoms before the rain. That was the last sketch I just did as a demonstration. So. That's it. If anybody has any questions or wants to talk, I'm happy to hear. Okay. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, these were really extraordinary, uh, especially the way you have the ability to bring together beautiful images, but also politically powerful images. So we might uh, talk a little bit about that. Because uh, John Domini had to leave, we're going to improvise a little bit. We will stick with the first part of our post presentation, which is Fred Godfrey. But then after Fred, I would like uh, Andy Langelato, who was oh, a yeah. student of your father's, to speak. Uh, she considers your father a mentor. So first, the word uh, to Fred Godfrey, who has written very eloquently about Bill's work. Fred. Thank you, Stan. And uh, Bill, I, I really miss, uh, I got to spend six months in VA tree. Uh, little did I know I was a neighbor of Bill's at the time. And um, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. Um, but what I wanted to draw people's attention to is the present versus past focus of his work. Uh, many Italian American writers and artists go back to Italy and they're trying to capture what's in their memory from their grandparents and their parents. Um, Bill still keeps his focus on the immigrant, but it's the immigrant to Italy, not the immigrant from Italy that he focuses on. And it's the difference between his work and his father's work, as I've read, written in an article, which if you're interested, I could email it to you. It, I'll, I'll put it up somewhere. Um, but there's a difference in, in the perspective uh, that he brings to the work. He looks beyond ethnicity. He doesn't look, for, you know, whenever I went to Italy, I, I kept looking for my past. I would be in a graveyard and I would look at names and I'd say, oh, those are names of people in my hometown. And I was always connecting to the past, but Bill connects the present to the future. And I think this is the important thing that happens here. And it's the important thing that happens in the evolution of Italian American art. You know, so much of our art has been focused on recapturing, recapturing, recapturing the past, and what it means and how it builds into us. Um, and, and, and this is a way of focusing on the future. And I think Annie's gonna lead into this a little bit later. When, when we go back to Italy, many of us begin to see the things that we were told about, but I also think that we begin to see new things and there's a new Italy there. There's an Italy that my grandfather probably wouldn't even recognize. Uh, and, and something that he certainly didn't communicate to me. In this ability to look beyond ethnicity, we are able to find, I think, a greater sense of humanity. Um, as I wrote in the article Bill quoted earlier, uh, Italian Americans are invisible because we refuse to be seen as Italian Americans. While the immigrants that Bill deals with and makes very visible in his work are invisible like African-Americans were, the way James Baldwin described them, because people don't want to see them. 
And so Bill, Bill, Bill forces you to see them. Um, and this is a way for us to be able to connect to today's immigrants, not only to Italy, but the new immigrants in our society and to change the way we begin to look at this. Another aspect I, I think that's important is that the work of art, in other words, the work of Bill's art focuses on the art of work. And I think the art of work is something that makes the immigrant visible and viable, necessary. You know, these people are visible. They're doing the necessary work that nobody else wants to do, that maybe nobody else can do. And this, through this work, and it is through the same kind of work that our grandparents went through that made them, you know, uh, viable uh, parts of American culture. It was the work, the art, and especially the sense of the art of work. The difference between Bill's work and his father's work is that Joe, I always see as the Old Testament to ethnicity and to immigration. Bill, I see as a New Testament. Now you can read all the biblical things you want into that, but the focus of the Old Testament is order and, and uh, uh, justice. Uh, and justice usually comes eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, etc. The New Testament is usually about what, what does Christ teach? Love. Well, by understanding and connecting, we are expanding our abilities to, to reach out to other people and to expand that notion of love. And so I, that's another way I see the fear of the past gives us a, a, a courage if, if, we, if we fight it, the courage to create new worlds. And that's what's happening with, with, the, with the migration to, to Italy. No longer are we citizens of a place, we are citizens of the world. Uh, John Dalmany does this uh, very similar in his work, in his uh, novels uh, on, on Naples. He, he, he focuses on, on immigrants, on the, on the immigrants in Italy in his novels. Um, I'm hoping someday that Stan will agree to, uh, to uh, chair uh, an, a, 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 an event like this where we'll have John Dominey, and, uh, Annie Lanzi Lockdo, Bill Papaleo, and there's a, there's a new documentary that just came out called My Father's Naples. Um, so I'm gonna end there and turn it over to Annie or turn it over back to, back to Stan who will bring Annie in. Right, thank you, Fred. Uh, so Annie, could you unmute yourself and join the conversation? Uh, yeah. Hey, everybody. Oh, so, uh, Annie, first introduce yourself. So I'm Annie Lanzolato, and when I got to Sarah Lawrence in the MFA program, quickly I switched from my lesbian writing mentor to Joe Papaleo. And at Sarah Lawrence, they call the mentors Dons. So I had the privilege of calling him Don Papaleo. And Joe Papaleo was the first person, male or female, to make me understand that I was an Italian American writer. And he decoded for me machismo, my father as a shell-shocked war veteran from Okinawa, my friend's fathers whose machismo was destroying them as 18 year old girls. And, and Joe decoded everything for me. He had such a kindness. And any of his students will attest to the letters that he wrote. He was one of the great all time letter writers. And we all have files of his letters. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, Bill, I'm crying here. You know, Stan brought me to Napoli in 2018. And just this week, I wrote a play about two fishermen who argue whether to take in people from the sea or leave them there. Wow. And the arguments about the boat getting impounded and then the fishermen losing work <laughs> while the boat is you know, inspected to make sure it's not the scene of a murder rather than a refugee rescue, you know. <laughs> and um, your, your statements about just being an artist who's present in the world and your interaction with the world as it is today and everyone on the street and everyone in the sea and everyone mending nets and 
everyone fishing and, and making red peppers and, <laughs> and everyone, that is the role of the artist in society. That is the role of the artist. And, you know, one painful moment I had, um, I was walking and talking to everyone in the street and the person I was with who was more, you know, a tourist was saying, what, what are you talking to them for? <laughs> like, what, what are you doing? Like, shut up and just walk. We have the castle to get to. We have the church to get to. What are you talking to people? <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's a painful moment for an artist to have to explain mm -hmm. this is our role in society. <laughs> anyway, this is the moment. You, this is my father was just like you. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell you one other thing. I mean, your father in our sessions in his office at Sarah Lawrence would talk about you. Hmm. And he filled me with you know, this amazing image of this son who moved back. And it, it always filled me with a longing to move back. But you were part of his teaching to us as young writers. So I just want you to know that. Oh, wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Well, he always talked about you, Bill, hmm. always. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think, yeah, yeah, we're, we're you know, uh, you can do it metaphorically and do it. I, I did a radical move. I mean, I did a radical move, but it, it, it was, it was natural in, in, for me, you know, it, it just happened. One thing happened. I, you know, I, I, my father was a true improviser. He was a yes. And, you know, that was his, like I said, mentioned with Toto and, and I, I didn't have it all planned out at all. I took a one-way ticket. I had made some money on a show and I bought a one-way ticket to Italy. I was, but, but it just, you know, it was the right time at the right moment and things work out. And that's also happens to artists. You know, you, if you follow your, you know, follow your bliss, as Joseph Campbell would say. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was really, really proud of you so much. And Tony Papaleo <laughs> as well. You know, so the, his second wife, right? Oh, she, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So yeah, she came, they both came several times, yeah. Mm -hmm. So proud of you. And that last trip she took, mm -mm. you know, meant so much to her. I mean, I, mm -mm. She, she told me in Bronxville, you know, when, when she was in her last mm -hmm. months, let's say, and she just was so grateful to be able to walk through mm -mm. town with you. Well, I realized that, you know, I didn't think of it at the time because I, you know, my mother had been Anglo-Saxon. Well, I didn't realize like when, when my father mentioned when he was just, he thought he was just writing about his family at first, but then he realized, oh, you know, it's, it's those moments when you're a writer, every one of us, a writer, painter, artist, when you're writing, you just think, oh, I'm just doing, this is my thing. I'm just, you know, uh, and then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, this is part of something much bigger. My radical move, suddenly it was, it was a move that, was, that touched something. It touches something in all Italian Americans because there's something that I did it, you know, I, I didn't think I was doing anything particular. I just was following step by step, you know, what happened. But there's something in all of us. And I think Fred has mentioned this in his writings. Uh, it's essential for Italian Americans to understand what really Italy is. And so whatever way you do it, it's got to be done to really be, to live fully and to also to, to expand, to, to expand and live well in America or wherever you live. It's, it's essential to understand what, what we're from. It's, it's so huge, the, uh, the heritage that we have, that we have to understand it on a personal level in some way. And each will do it in a different way. Well, I'd love to hear you talk about light technique. Mm -hmm. You've absorbed the light, you know, in that part of the, I mean, I'd just love to hear you talk about it all. Materials, mm -hmm. light. Mm -mm. No. Okay, I would. I mean, I don't, you have a, I, well, I mentioned. I, I mentioned actually, it started of all places in Massachusetts because I, I don't know. You know, I, I had so many things to say. I, I, I sorry went over time, but uh, uh, you know, uh, my painting teacher in America was had was in a direct line to Monet from William Merritt Chase, who was a friend of Monet, and and he had started these lessons and light and and so I had and then the mudheads working with dark skinned people on the uh, on the fish barrels of Provincetown, you know, they'd work with these Portuguese immigrants against the light. And it was a way to, uh, to, to take also Monet's lesson into the figure study. And so it just seemed, when I was in it, Southern Italy, most of the time is sunny. And so uh, it was a perfect, it just seemed a natural. Uh, and then strangely enough, I also mentioned Turner uh, started his impressionism on the Amalfi Coast. I saw it in a Tate Gallery show. I saw how he changed. So it all seemed to, uh, connect through the light. It's gorgeous, just so gorgeous and inspiring. I mean, I'd I'd love to write about your paint, to write poetry, you know, on your paintings. 
oh, well, yeah, that's something I hope to develop with the Sarah Lawrence workshop that we do. You should, we'll keep in touch. We'll keep in touch. Because that's something we've done online and we've done it in Chittada. We hope to continue and we definitely hope to continue. All right. Thanks, Stan, for bringing me in. Love to everybody. Stay safe. Thank you, Annie. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, before we uh, end, uh, I just want to acknowledge a couple of questions in the chat, if you haven't sure, seen sure. them. First of all, uh, I apologize. I put it in the chat, but for those of you that want to see more of Bill's work, he has a website, which is www.williampapaleo.com and williampapaleo.it for Italy. Um, so you can see more of his work there and get some information about. Also, his there's story. a Facebook artist page. There's a Facebook artist page that you can go to and become part of. Right. And and also, I mentioned uh, the Joe Papalo archives, which I'm trying to set up. As Annie mentioned, you know, th there's a lot of writers and students that have letters of my father. I'm trying to sort of, I'd like to archive that as well, uh, to um, just and just keep it open to to promote. Uh, students of his and people that are connected to him in any way. Right. So you can find that request on Facebook, this uh, a, a archive that Bill is putting together. from The Joe Papaleo archives. That's for my father. And exactly. then my, my artist page is open to anybody. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, Alfonso Mauro asks uh, in that uh, image that you had of the female uh, ceramic workers in yes. the is that Mrs. Mafalda Cassetta? Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> yes, and so what an eye. Alfonso Mauro recognizes Mafalda Caseta halfway around the world. So that's extraordinary. <laughs> then Fred Gardafay was attempting to do James Joyce Finnegan's Wake by cleaning his keyboard. <laughs> um, uh, and then Maria Wilson asks, I wonder about your opinion about how economically able Italy is to handle all of the immigrants that are still coming there. Uh, well, you know, the thing is, it's, uh, you have to be careful. You know, the thing is, um, it's, it's not as much as there's this political thing, and I'm sure as Americans, you know, this idea that the, the crisis, the crisis, but it's still a fraction. Uh, the, the immigrants that come are, do the work that the Italians don't do. They, the, and they, uh, they get absorbed into very, they're paid like $7 a day to, you know, to work in the fields and with, uh, and they're sprayed with pesticides and all things like that. And, and so they're doing a lot of the work. So it is actually they're contributing to the economy, uh, which is something probably true in America. So instead of thinking in terms of the crisis, which I, when I remember one time I came back to Italy and the crisis, it was all over the crisis. And I talked to some Africans, what, what, where's the crisis? Nothing has changed. It's just the newspapers have decided, the right wing newspapers decide it's a crisis. And I don't know if that echoes uh, right now. Instead of talking about anything that's happening in America, you, you, if you go to Fox News, it's the crisis, the crisis, you know. And but what the reality is and what the crisis is are two very, very different things, um, because actually they're exploited and they're 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 useful for the economy. Yeah, right. yeah. And as I've said, you know, this idea of la crisi, the, the <laughs> word crisis, the, the, actually comes has a, a medical etymology, right? Like the moment when a patient is either going to make it or not make it. So it's a very defined and constrained temporal uh, uh, thing. But La Crisi now has been like for a couple of generations in Italy. So it's not, it's a permanent condition. It's not like where something is actually going to change. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's important to understand. Hmm. Anyway, uh, Bill Papaleo, thank you very much. Also my thanks to Fred Gardafe, Annie Lanzolato, all of you that attended. Uh, we are not leaving Naples in case you want to return next month on April 13th at our regular time, 630. Matteo Troncone, who is an independent filmmaker, has uh, made a documentary called uh, L'Aranciarsi, Aranciarsi, you know, the, the typical Italian, especially Southern Italian uh, skill of figuring things out, you know, systematizing yourself, working all of the angles. Uh, and it's, uh, the subtitle is Pizza and the Art of Living. So you'll want to join us April 13th at 6.30. Uh, if you need more information, just email me or the Hofstra Cultural Center. Uh, again, as a couple of people have asked, this presentation will be preserved. Everybody who's registered will receive an email link uh, to, the, uh, to the presentation. So again, Bill Papaleo, thank you all very much uh, and hope to see everyone next month.
So, ciao, ciao. Okay. Ciao. ciao. Thank care, you. Bro. Thank you very Take much. Care, okay.